really glad that Eric Byers made it back to S4 this year. Uh, he's and he's really good to back cleanup because he's a very energetic, uh, entertaining presenter. So I, I think it'll be a great presentation. He, he graciously moved from yesterday to today because Eric Knapp is sick and unable to attend. Uh, it was funny. Um, I know Kim was at Black Hat, and some of you are at Black Hat. I, I haven't even told you this, Eric, but yeah. I saw Dylan Beresford was doing his presentation on the Siemens S7 capabilities at Black Hat, and he had the Siemens PLCs up there, and he was showing, hey, I can make the lights on the front turn on and turn off. And I was thinking, I saw Eric Byers do that in 2002 <laughs> at, at, a, at an ISA conference. So they're starting to catch up with you, Eric. It was uh, good I work know. by Dylan. But, um, so or maybe it, it's just 10 last years. You know? Exactly. <laughs> so Eric has, has uh, been in this industry for a while. He's currently the VP of Engineering and CTO at Tofino Security, which is now a division of Belden. Congratulations. Yeah, and uh, we'll let you take it away. All right. Thanks. So um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit was uh, my experience um, with um, addressing vulnerabilities. Um, over the last year and a half, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, three, well, four vendors who uh, found themselves facing a vulnerability. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about w what their experience was because we, um, Sean did a great presentation about patching uh, or the lack thereof. Uh, and the lack of patches and the vulnerabilities that are out there. And, and, and it was a really good presentation. And um, really, this is a continuation on in many respects about what Sean, what Sean talked about. When he talked about, oh, I, the other one that caught me, I think you said 60% uh, didn't work or something like that. So I have some, uh, some similar experiences, and I, I want to talk about them. Um, because I think one of the criticisms that we hear right now, um, right or wrong, is um, researcher finds vulnerability. Researcher says to vendor, uh, get a patch ready. I'm going to announce this vulnerability. And vendor does or does not. And then that's sort of the end of the story. And if the vendor comes out with a patch, good on the vendor. Uh, if the vendor doesn't come out with a patch, bad on the vendor. But I think that's only half the story. And I, and I want to talk about um, what happens to that patch. So um, obviously, I, I, I'm. We're talking about a problem statement that I don't even have to go through, that everybody knows here that the reason we're in this soup right now is because 30 years ago, we were building control system products that where the secu word security was not involved. Uh, we were interested in safety. We were interested in reliability. We were interested in efficiency. We were interested in, but I mean, I remember writing stuff in the uh, early 80s. And security, what's that? Don't know. That's how, to, how I get in my car with a key. And that was the full stop. So you know, the fact that I didn't design security into the products that I built and the systems I built 30 years ago um, or anybody else was literally because it wasn't on our mindset. OK, so because this wasn't on the design consideration, we use protocols that aren't secure. We uh, have user processes. The, the users expect to do things that are inherently insecure. Uh, and the underlying subsystems, like uh, Darren mentioned earlier, uh, we talked about, um, I th so Darren, somebody mentioned uh, uh, the, the um, things like VxWorks. No, that was Sean as well, right? Uh, anyway, and you know, these, these subsystems are not secure. So you have these, this whole problem where we're stuck with probably at least a decade, maybe longer, where we are trying to get 30-year-old architectures and designs caught up to 2012. Okay, so let's consider the IT solution, which is to go patch, which is, and you know, take for example, um, um, oh, let's take Adobe for example, because we do a constant patch cycle in the IT world. Well, I just went and looked through Adobe Reader. Now, uh, the Windows version has had 27 patches in the last. Uh, three years. About 150 odd vulnerabilities are, are listed in the um, National Vulnerability Database. Um, so that means that, they're, that as a user, if you're wanting to keep up with it on a plant floor, you're going to be patching almost every month for one product. Um, well, is that going to work? Well, 
my next question is, well, that's one product on the plant floor. How many patches do we really need? And um, in 2008, I worked with a large refinery uh, in the U.S. Uh, trying to figure out uh, their patch situation and how to clean up some problems they were having with their control systems. Now, this is a fairly good-sized refinery. It had 85 computers on their process control network. Uh, we only got good data on 78. These were Windows machines. They were a variation, everything from NT4 to 2003. Um, they, we went out and we um, built a little tool to go out and find all the processes that were running on them to see how much uh, code variation there was. And there was uh, just short of 300 uh, unique processes out there. Um, and uh, of those uh, 300 processes, 48 had uh, listings in the National Vulnerability Database. Okay. And when we looked through all those, we found out that there was a little over four, sorry, 5,000 vulnerabilities on that plant floor. Not good. Uh, published vulnerabilities. Now, with a little bit of aggressive operating system patching, which this company had been doing, uh, we got uh, that down to a little over 2,000 vulnerabilities. What was wrong here was that simply uh, they had been focusing on operating systems and completely forgot about Adobe Reader or the antivirus package they were using or everything else. And so they were leaving all these systems unpatched and building up quite a list of vulnerabilities for anybody who got onto that process control network. Now, that's only half the story because back in 2008, I believe there was one listing for a control system vulnerability. Um, I don't th and in the National Vulnerability Database, maybe there was two. And so does that mean that all the application uh, the control system applications were perfect. They had no vulnerabilities. How many people vote for that? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I don't think we're going to get a vote for that. So we needed to say, well, the problem here isn't that the, there are no vulnerabilities. They just haven't been listed in the NVD. Um, and we wanted to try and figure out how many vulnerabilities we were looking at if we started to try and patch the, the control system applications. Okay. So uh, we estimated that there was about uh, 60,000 um, um, uh, kilo lines of code uh, of non-OS code, non-NDV listed code uh, per PC. In other words, these are applications that were running on the PC. Maybe they were vulnerability free, but we doubted it. We just thought they hadn't been tested. So these were the HMIs. These were the, the historians. These were all these things. Okay. So. We um, then calculated a vulnerability uh, to line of code ratio um, for all the um, applications that we had found listed, and it turned out to be about 0.16% to estimate what we call residual vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that are out there, hanging out there, that were just waiting to be found when somebody had a, a hard look at this application. Okay. Well, the bad news is, is that worked out to be about 96 undiscovered or unpublished vulnerabilities per machine. Uh, on that control system, a mess. Okay, uh, and again, that's assuming that they'd been up to date on patching every uh, common IT application, and they'd been uh, covering all their uh, OS uh, applications with current patching. Now, this is very, very conservative. Um, by using that 0.16% ratio, that would say that uh, Adobe um, Reader should have about. Um, based on its number of lines in code, should have about five vulnerabilities. And I believe, as I said earlier, I think it has about 150 vulnerabilities. It also was assuming that um, the, that ratio assumes that of the IT software, all the vulnerabilities possible have been found in 2008. Again, probably not a good assumption. OK, so what we're facing here, or what this operator was facing, is a huge number of vulnerabilities on their plant floor that they were potentially going to patch as people discovered vulnerabilities, you know, discovered and published these vulnerabilities and vendors pro produced product, probably more than they could uh, reasonably manage. Okay. There was a second problem that concerned us, and there's a really good paper that came out um, just in uh, September uh, on the patches, uh, on the effect of patches called the um, uh, do, uh, how do um, how do fixes become bugs? And one of the things this paper said or noted is they looked at operating system uh, patches that had been released uh, over the last five years. And they noted that these fixes that were publicly released um, 
depending on the operating system, somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of the fixes for the operating systems uh, were in incorrect. In, in other words, somebody released a patch or a fix, and it either did a number of things. It just plain didn't work. Uh, as Ruben was quoted earlier, that's just a dumb fix. That's not a patch. Uh, or uh, it uh, crashed the system, or it had some uh, severe impacts. Uh, about a half of the incorrect fixes uh, would call crash, cause crashes and hangs. Um, that's really bad for a control system. Okay, so basically, um, for a faulty patch, you're facing a number of problems here. You can either uh, fail to resolve the problem, as Ruben had mentioned, or you break the functionality in your system that you expected to be there, like the operating system works, or uh, it takes away a previous feature that a, a, a customer had come to know and love. Okay, all right. Even the good patches may cause us problems. Okay, they could um, cause a shut, force a shutdown and restart of your process. Not good. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, again, remove functionality that the the customer had relied on. Um, it could also require staff to be present that just weren't that were at a skill level that weren't normally there in a control system. Okay, so I'll give you a specific example of how that impacts you on the, um, with Slammer. Now that's an old. This is an old old patch. And um, one of the oil companies, um, I was doing some consulting with them uh, uh, just uh, right at the time of Slammer, and they ran into a little problem. Um, they had large production facilities in the Gulf of Mexico, numerous platforms. You can see this little map. Here's the area around New Orleans, and you can see all the production facilities out there. Um, they uh, out came uh, Microsoft with a, a patch uh, well before Slammer hit. Uh, and struck. I was in July 2002, they, Microsoft came out, and the company started to do its rollout. But the problem was, is that the, um, the patch required um, a fairly sophisticated reboot of the Windows servers, if you remember this patch. Uh, and again, Slammer hasn't hit yet. Um, and uh, it required a Windows expert, because if the, if the um, patch went wrong, you really had a dead uh, server. And so they needed to send out somebody who is a Windows expert out onto the platforms. But at the same time, um, you can't just take anybody and put them on the platform. He has to be safety trained to go out on the platform, and there was only a few people who were able to do that. And so they were in a race against time between doing the patches because they couldn't get the people out there, and eventually Slammer struck, <coughs> um, taking advantage of that particular vulnerability. Uh, and there was nothing they could do about it. They literally couldn't get enough experts onto the platforms to, re to properly patch those machines. Okay, so um, basically, this is one of the problems you face as you start to push patches out there, is do you have the expertise to be able to actually install them in your system? Now, I mentioned the other thing is, can you afford the shutdown if it's going to be a patch? And um, I worked for a number of years in the aluminum industry, um, and those previous slides are talking about Windows boxes, but take the example of, a, of an aluminum smelting operation. Now, if you're doing aluminum smelting, you have what's called a pot line. And a pot line, you basically are putting um, aluminum oxide ore bauxite in, and you, you put a big, uh, two big um, electrodes in, a cathode and an anode, and you run electricity through these uh, to basically uh, convert this uh, oxide ore into raw metal. Now, the trouble is, uh, if that goes down, that aluminum starts to harden. And the moment that aluminum hardens, it changes electrical properties. <coughs> and you can no, and it becomes very, very low resistance, so you can no longer run your electrodes. And you end up with your whole pot line being a solid aluminum blob. Um, so now, OK, the, the process was designed to try and deal with that. It's, uh, uh, there would be redundant PLCs. Uh, there was lots of protection to make sure that something was working, or it was always working, so you didn't have this problem. But as soon as you started to introduce patching to it, you would remove half of the redundancy. And so there was this huge reluctance by this aluminum smelter to, to make any changes to the pot line until a maintenance shutdown, which were, in this particular operation was once a year. So their delay between being informed of a patch and actually deploying it was a full year. Okay. 
even if you aren't dealing with that, um, how fast can you patch in a regulated or controlled uh, process industry? And a good example and an answer to that was a really excellent paper that was done by AstraZeneca a few years ago in uh, ISX, ISA Expo. They measured how fast they could reliably install a patch into their control systems. And they started out with a tiered system. They would do test platforms. It would take them about four days to be able to uh, um, install the patch on their central test platforms. Uh, and then they would um, work with sample servers with the critical s systems for another four days. Then they'd push them out to early adopters, then out to their mainstream systems another 10 days. And then very, very high risk systems or um, because they're a pharmaceutical company, validated servers would take about another 10 days. They estimated that there was no possible way they could push a patch completely through their plant in less than 34 days. So again, you go back to the situation that somebody like Adobe uh, feeds us, which is we're going to release a patch every 34 days, and, and these guys for one product would be on a continuous patch cycle. Um, so I guess what's probably getting clear here is that there's a problem here in trying to rely on patches. Now, am I saying patches are evil, they shouldn't exist? No. But what I am saying is being dependent on them is not the solution. Okay. Now, I'll give you another couple of examples. I, wanted, I mentioned I'd work with a couple of vendors and, and what they faced as they went forward trying to patch. The first vendor, um, all vendors will, except for one, will be rena remain nameless. Um, this was an internal testing, so it wasn't uh, a researcher who found the vulnerability. Um, they did internal testing and they found the security vulnerability in, the, in a very mission critical product, a part of their product portfolio. Unfortunately, it was in the OS supplied by a third party. Again, uh, I think uh, that was mentioned earlier today by um, um, uh, Mr. McBride. Uh, they went to the OS vendor and the OS vendor refused to deal with it. Just point blank, I'm, I'm afraid we're not interested in dealing with that. We're, that's something we'll, we'll look at it later. We're not going to deal with it now. And so there was no patch for these guys at all. Uh, they were really stuck at this point. If somebody in, in the researcher community had, had put out a, an announcement of this vulnerability, they really would have been, they would have been on that list that Sean had mentioned earlier of the uh, half of the vendors with no patches. There was nothing they could do. I'll move on to a second vendor um, that I worked with. Um, and this vendor got faced with a vulnerability that was found by a researcher and was going to be released. Uh, now, this particular patch, uh, this um, patch would remove the back doors, which was really good. This, this, this vendor found uh, a number of back doors into this system. Unfortunately, what had happened is that the uh, remote support team had become dependent on these. They had got really used to using some of these tools for troubleshooting. And uh, so, so uh, they were faced with this problem that uh, if they took the, if they put through the patches, they would have a very disgruntled uh, remote support team. Now their decision was to uh, use, uh, to put patches out and close all these back doors. Uh, but what they found subsequently is that some of the customers then were reluctant to install the patches themselves. They were saying, well, would that slow down our remote support? So at this point, you've got customer resistance. Okay. Interestingly, we were looking at some statistics about um, patch acceptance by customers. And um, for their previous patches, security and non-security, uh, less than 10% of their customers appear to be downloading patches. OK. Third vendor that I am going to release the name on is our company. Uh, we ran into a situation where we had to do a vulnerability patch. And it was in version 1.6. Uh, we released that a year and a half ago. Uh, and in it, we wanted to deal with um, both some performance issues and some security issues, particularly around uh, some of the things that came out with the SSL issues back then. Okay, so we put out this announcement. We have a list of everybody who uses our product, so we could contact them directly. Um, we offered them free upgrades, and normally we charge for functional upgrades. This is a free upgrade. It included not only all the patches, but all the new features, everything else. If you downloaded the patch, you didn't have to install it. You just have to download it. It was yours to keep 
and it was more than just a patch. It was a full system upgrade, uh, absolutely free if you did it in 30 days. We contacted everybody with multiple emails. At the end of 30 days, almost uh, about 10% uh, uh, had bothered to try and download it. We went through the whole thing again, and only 30% of our customers bothered to download the free upgrade. So at this point, I was about ready to slit my wrist. We still have a significant number of customers who literally won't take a free patch. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to end this, these, four sto or these stories uh, and move on to some solutions with one sad vulnerability story. And, and this was a vulnerability that was discovered uh, a few years ago by a researcher, me, when I was working at BCIT. And I found this vulnerability. And, and, and nice thing about working at BCIT as a researcher uh, is I got paid in advance. Um, people who do re security research, or research end up getting paid after they find the vulnerability. But I got paid in advance uh, to do the work, so that was kind of a nice bonus. you know. But the downside is I was under NDA. Whatever I found belonged to the people who paid the money, in this case, a large end user. Okay, uh, They had a large continuous process. And when I found this vulnerability um, in a PLC, I went to them and I said, I'd really like to take this to the vendor. And their answer was, uh, no. Not now. Huh? And they said, look, we just did our, uh, we just did our um, fall upgrade. We won't be shutting down for a year. We'd really like you to hold on to this for four months. So my point in all of this is the bad news about patches and, and, and that what we're facing here is that I don't think that we can depend on patching as a solution. I, I think that, yes, a, a good metric is whether the uh, um, vendors make patches for their products when somebody finds a vulnerability, but it's certainly not a metric that's going to show you whether there's going to be secure product deployed out in the field. I think there's actually very little correlation between whether a patch is actually available and whether a patch is actually deployed. Okay. Um, I also think it's very unrealistic when somebody finds a vulnerability, even if the vendor can produce a patch quickly, that it's going to be deployed quickly. As I said, AstraZeneca determined they could not patch faster than 34 days and do it safely within uh, the requirements of a pharmaceutical company. Um, the company that wouldn't let me do a patch or do a, a vulnerability um, disclosure to the vendor, again, was looking at a patch cycle of one year. Um, so there's uh, some real problems here um, with patches. Uh, QA requirements make it hard to do the patching. Uh, it's, there may be no reasonable patch if they don't own the underlying operating system. And the patch may um, impact the functionality of their product in ways they hadn't expected. And the customers get worried about downtime. The customers get worried about uh, uh, impact on operations. They get worried about whether the patches work on the legacy uh, equipment they have. Um, and they get worried about their manpower limitations. So they have the bodies to go out and do the patching. Are the people properly trained? Okay. So over the last two years, I've been thinking about this, about what do we do about it? How do we avoid having to just depend on patches? And again, I want to be really clear. I'm not saying we shouldn't make patches and we shouldn't patch. That's not my point. It's, it's like Andrew's earlier talk. Uh, it, it's just a, not a silver bullet to patch, and we can't depend on it. We need some alternatives. So um, earlier, there was a, an interesting talk about mitigating uh, or compensating controls and how ISA is really pushing for the use of compensating controls. And, and this is really what I believe is needed. Uh, and I'm going to give you uh, a couple of examples. You can call them mitigations. You can call them compensating controls. If you're Windows, you call them workarounds. But the idea is that if you can't patch, what's the alternative? And, is that alternative good enough until you can get around to getting a patch or installing the patch? Okay. So um, I've had some experience working in the telco operations um, a few years ago. Some of my staff are ex-telco people. And one of the things that a large telco like BT or Verizon will do is not patch instantaneously when the patch comes out, but depend on a very long patch cycle, uh, exactly what was asked earlier, delaying the number of patches and um, using mitigations, if at all possible, to be able to push out the, 
the uh, patch cycle. And I think the same applies here for control system world. Okay. Uh, again, I'll, I'll give you a specific example. Um, we had a client that was working specifically with uh, VxWorks. Uh, they had a problem with the PLCs. Um, they, rather than trying to patch the PLCs, and eventually they released a patch, but it was easier uh, for us to build them a mitigation, which was basically to control those back doors. Uh, and so, you know, that's a fairly simple example. If you can't uh, patch the PLC to shut down uh, 17, what is it, 585, then possibly another alternative is to control it by making sure that that traffic is literally blocked on the network. There's lots of benefits with this. Um, your mitigations can run independent of your product development. Uh, it's less possible, potentially less in impact on the actual functionality of the product, not necessarily. Uh, less QA potentially, you could do it faster because you're not worrying as much about trying to integrate it into a product. Uh, definitely lower customer resistance in my experience. Customers are very worried about upgrading a PLC or changing a PLC. Adding a new piece of product onto a Linus or doing a change to a firewall is, is a far lower um, chance of customer resistance for a number of reasons. Uh, probably one of the biggest ones is it's easy to back out. Once you've upgraded that PLC to the latest version, uh, you're really stuck. But if you put in a little piece of gear, or you add a firewall rule, or you put in an IDS rule, or, uh, then you can back that out pretty fast. Okay. And the other thing that I think is really important is um, there's a lot of legacy product out there. We're not going to make it go away. And a lot of the companies probably just can't. Uh, continually support 20-year-old product that's going to have holes in it. So rather than trying to um, address 20-year-old PLCs, an alternative solution is to say, can we do something that uh, will allow us just to mitigate the vulnerabilities in those 20-year-old PLCs? You know, and it's interesting, if you look at uh, the IT world, the solution for legacy gear is just to ignore it. Uh, uh, you know, you've got, you're running Windows NT and Stuxnet hits, well, just don't list Windows NT under the Microsoft vulnerabilities. That's just not one of the affected systems anymore, is it? Nor 2000. They're just not affected systems. Don't tell the worm. Um, <laughs> um, whereas in this world, legacy products doesn't just go away. It sticks around for 20 or 30 years. And so uh, by um, building a mitigations program, you can start to look at addressing this legacy product rather than trying to just patch it. Okay, some possible compensating controls or mitigations. Okay, product reconfiguration. Uh, telling the customer to make a change. In other words, like disable the HTTP port. Uh, pretty straightforward. A um, little tricky. Downside is whether the customer will do it. But you can definitely, it's a move forward if you can give very clear directions or even better, a little agent that they could run on their system and that would disable all the, uh, it would basically reconfigure all the PLCs or all the DCS so that those HD, uh, annoying <coughs> HTTP ports were shut off. Okay, possible. Another possibility is suggest firewall rules. If they have a firewall in place, you could say block all the HTTP traffic. You could uh, do things like uh, suggested IDS or uh, uh, rules or signatures, like um, the ones that Dale produced in the Quick, uh, quick Draw when uh, Dylan released. I think it was with Dylan, right? You released all the signatures to go with hmm? Luigi. It was with Luigi. Right. So Dale immediately releases these signatures. Now, this assumes that the clients have some sort of IDS in place. But it's a lot easier if they do, if they have some sort of uh, mechanism that they can push signatures into then the mitigations and the compensating controls are much easier for them. Much, much less uh, likely to face uh, significant re resistance from a, um, a can change management point of view. There's a couple of things, as if we look at this, that we have to do if we want this to work. Um, the most important thing in a control system is not security, it's safety and reliability. If we don't get the safety and reliability uh, message across, if we don't leave the users of control systems feeling that they're going to be just as safe before the mitigation as after the mitigation, forget it. It's not going to happen. It'll just get rejected. Um, I believe that's why people um, don't download patches or don't bother installing them. It's just like, I'm not sure. If I do nothing, then nobody can blame me. If I do something and my plant's down, I'm going to get it in the neck. So absolutely uh, critical that we make this low impact. 
Secondly, if it's complicated, um, as um, Bruce Schneier says, complexity is the enemy of security. And I really think it's critical that we make any mitigation uh, system dead simple. Because the people that have to run control loops are control engineers, not security engineers. And then the second, the last thing, I think it's really important that there's a reasonable total cost of ownership. Not the price of the initial installation or the hardware or anything like that, but the ability to maintain it. I was working on one system, and uh, the solution had been, with, which had a, a particularly uh, interesting little vulnerability, and the solution had been to put in a PC uh, to run some OPC tunneling software on it. Now, the OPC tunneling software was free, and the PC was, you know, a thousand bucks. But the cost for touching that PC continuously in this location was about $5,000 a year uh, for sending somebody out to patch it, uh, to uh, update the antivirus, etc. So really have to look at the whole total cost of ownership, not just the, the cost as purchased. Okay, so um, I've been thinking about this and working on this for these vendors and other vendors and uh, for various clients. Um, and I've really come up with a couple of thoughts that I think are, are really important. Oh, actually, this isn't the slide I expected. The other thing is, if it's a product, uh, it's really important, I think, that we separate configuration from field installation. I call this a zero configuration field deployment model. And what I mean is, uh, the person putting it in in the field is probably going to be an electrician, and he should be able to attach it to a DIN rail or a 19-inch rack. He should put in the power. He should plug in the network cables or turn it on or do something simple and walk away. As soon as you start to ask people to put in IP addresses, attach serial cables, uh, configure, configure, configure in the field, you run into that same problem that that oil company faced where you're going to have to send experts out to field locations where they're just simply not going to be able to get to quickly. And so um, absolutely critical. If we're talking about anything that's making changes in the field, any products in the field, it's really important we make this dead easy uh, from an installation point of view. Now, Complexity, once it's out there and plugged in and can be remotely configured, that's cool. You can add more complexity. But installation, in my experience, really has to be separated from configuration. Okay. Now, I make firewalls and, and work on things like that, little boxes. So that's obviously what I've been thinking mostly of in the last little while. And I've got a couple of options, and I'm going to talk about uh, these. Fixed configuration firewalls, uh, rule sets that are generated from the control logic itself, uh, fully configurable firewalls with templates. And then lastly, what I hope to see in the next little while uh, to address um, the problem of, of the number of patches likely, or the number of uh, vulnerabilities likely to be out there, is dynamically loaded firewalls. I'll talk about a fixed configuration wall, and I'll give you a specific example. Um, this is, the idea here is that you have a firewall or an appliance in the field. It could be an IDS. It could be a firewall that has rule sets that are pre-built and pre-loaded specifically to effectively whitelist the network so that only the protocols that the vendor expects to see get to its product will get to it. Okay. Uh, as well, um, having other rules checking for um, the protocols coming in and the, to look for the vulnerabilities that, that have been discovered on this product. Um, for example, uh, you could uh, do things like uh, allow FTP, Modbus, Ethernet, and SNMP traps on your firewall. You could have a standard fixed, factory fixed rule set for that product and then deny all other protocols and look for those default passwords that Dylan found or um, uh, Luigi's found or Ruben has found and literally um, watch the HTTP traffic or the FTP traffic for those and block it. Okay. Um, the benefits of something like a fixed configuration firewall is it's trivial for a customer to install. Uh, it can typically be installed in live systems. It's very simple QA, uh, very easy to QA because you're literally just making sure that it, that, uh, it interacts cleanly with the vendor pro or the PLC product. And you can upgrade it in the field. Uh, that's not to say if a new vulnerability comes out, you can't upgrade it. But it's better to upgrade a secondary component rather than the PLC itself. I have a couple of examples. One is one that we built specifically for Honeywell for their safety systems. That's a little picture of it. It's called the read-only Modbus firewall for their SIS, their safety integrated system. Uh, this was designed specifically to protect their safety integrated systems and their DCSs. There's no user configuration. You can't 
telnet into it. You can't SSH into it. You can't talk to it. There is no capability to communicate to it over the network. Uh, it is locked down so that only Modbus read data will pass through it. Any other type of traffic going through it, uh, be it non-Modbus, being it uh, Modbus writes or Modbus programming commands, get chucked out. And it basically does a sanity check to make sure that all the protocols going, all the Modbus through it is well formed, meets the RFP. Okay. Uh, the configuration is locked down to what a safety system would expect. Okay. Um, and this particular one, because it's possible that some new vulnerability may come out, some new issue may come out, uh, for example, uh, rate limiting or something like that because of a potential denial of service attack on Modbus, then the idea is that it can be field upgraded uh, in the field by a user where they just simply put in a USB key on the bottom, uh, hit that little button there, and it'll load the new configuration. But beyond loading new configurations, there's really nothing a user can do to it. Uh, another example is um, generating the rule sets um, from the uh, user logic. And this was designed uh, for Triconics. Uh, in their case, they use a lot of, or they use OPC to talk to their safety systems, um, among other protocols. Uh, they had some issues with OPC, and they really, really wanted to sanity check the OPC traffic. So, uh, but the problem was is that the configuration may change, and so you can't have a lockdown configuration. So what was done here is they didn't want it really programmable by the user, but what they thought would be an acceptable solution was that if the user uh, takes the logic from their, from their configuration, so this is using um, uh, TriStation, the programming software, exports the configuration, then we were able to interpret what devices were talking to this particular equipment um, because that's in the configuration, what protocols are being used because we know what modules have been configured, um, uh, what devices are being are on, um, what the IP addresses of the particular tri-stations, enough to build a pretty complete rule set. And then that then, uh, we interpreted the, this, the um, database, and then we're able to stuff that into uh, firewall rules, encrypt it, and load into the firewall. So that the idea here, again, was that the customer never really had to deal with firewall rules. All they had to do is take their application software, export their databases, and it would turn into firewall. Again, firewall rules. So the idea, again, here is to make this very, very simple and easy for uh, the customer not forcing them to uh, require expertise beyond control system engineering. Okay, the last one, or second to last one, is uh, the concept of building firewall templates. Um, and this is the idea that uh, taking uh, pre built templates so that when a vendor releases uh, uh, notice or somebody releases notice of a vulnerability, say the M340 vulnerabilities, the idea is that you could build uh, templates, and this is a idea, this is futures, uh, that we could build templates that, similar to what Dale created, that could be loaded into protection devices on the plant floor uh, that would be built by the vendor to particularly address those vulnerabilities that were being announced. Okay. Again, the nice thing about this is this can be independent of any product release. It may take four months to release the patches, but something like a template could probably be done in much shorter time. The last thing, and this is strictly future, this is a project I'm working on using a technology called IFMAP, and this is um, to dynamically load rule sets into the field um, using uh, the IFMAP protocol. Basically, IFMAP is a trusted computing group um, initiative um, where uh, you have a security <laughs> event manager that's uh, detecting events and it then uh, feeds uh, into the rule server appropriate rules that get pushed down dynamically. And these rules could be firewall rules. In the case of the experiments we're doing right now, they're VPN connection rules. Uh, who's allowed to connect to who at any given point of time? So uh, we see this is really important because, again, I mentioned uh, total cost of ownership. I think it's important over the long run that we uh, start to take away the effort in the field of loading rules, making changes, and try and make this uh, much more automatic and dynamic because um, the threat environment is going to be very automatic and dynamic. So a few final thoughts and then some questions. Um, I, I don't think the end users will patch much. I, I, 
honestly, they don't patch right now in my experience. That's not to say that more sophisticated companies aren't out there doing patching, but if you look at the bulk of the end users, you know, I know Johan and Exxon and different companies uh, you know, are, have very aggressive patch uh, programs. I've seen lots and lots of good patching. But as a group, the end users currently are very, very scared of patching. Um, so I really think that the uh, security fixes need to be separated away from the product, patch, uh, product fixes. Um, and we need this separation so that we can be more responsive. Whatever we do, whether it's my idea of firewalls or IDS, is it has to be simple. It has to be separate from the QA cycle. It has to be provably safe, and it has to be upgradable in the field. If we don't get those, then it won't be used. Yes, thanks. Thank you very much. Time for a couple questions. Any questions for Eric? It's like Tudor SRI, and you may have touched on this a little bit uh, later on, but um, you said that 30% of your, um, your customers uh, tried to download the patch. Did you ever get a chance to talk to any of the other 60% to get a gauge for what their reasons were? Yeah, we were phoning them. I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> did, you, did you get to understand why they were not? You know, yeah. Was there a general, uh, you know? Yeah, there was a, a large degree of, I don't have time, it's working, it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, it wa <laughs> we tried to convince them it was broken, and it would work better. <coughs> yeah, I mean, we phoned a bunch. I didn't phone all our customers, <coughs> but Scott and I started spot calling people. And, and eventually somebody would, uh, somebody would pop up and they'd say, you know, four months later, they'd say, well, now we're ready to patch. But there's no way we were able to drive the timeline. So, Darren Highfield, you yeah, tell Darren. us that. Um, I, I, following on to, to Zach's question and also related to some points you were making about the, you know, the need for cost effectiveness and, 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 and so on, um, it may not affect uh, it may not affect you know how rapidly patches or how much they're adopted or how rapidly they're adopted um, you know all that immediately but it certainly it seems like if we could actually capture some of the costs that are actually invoked when you have somebody with oil platforms that they aren't able to you know to, to patch things there's there's an actual they could probably pretty tangibly identify how much the fact, you know, that they had half of their yeah. platforms get caught, yes. you know, how much that cost them. Yes. Um, and while that may or may not, like I said, may or may not affect patching as much as some other things, that metric would actually be fantastically useful to an awful lot of other efforts to try to say, you know, the conversation really shouldn't be about the cost of security. The conversation should be about the cost of functionality. Right. I, I think what you're saying is we need to catch some metrics about what it costs to patch and what it costs not to patch. Yes. And, 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 you know, there's sort of little bits and pieces of anecdotal evidence around laying around of the cost of not patching. But I, I agree, it's not sort of glued together in any coherent manner. Uh, maybe... Um, the repository for industrial security incidents, John Cusimano's effort, you know, could start looking at that. But yeah, it's that's something that I don't think, and and perhaps you know some large uh, end users could do that. But I think it would be very very useful. The price of not securing versus securing. Hopefully, it would be more expensive to not secure, or we're all out of work. Um, I imagine one of the best ways to encourage uh, users to patch. Uh, would be if the hardware vendors themselves uh, came up with a high availability solution. That is, I can, I can take this unit offline, fail over to another unit that's working, that's fine. I do the patch on this, uh, this unit that's now offline, flip it back. If it still works, great. If not, I still have that, and I can revert uh, back and pull out of the patch. But as long as uh, a unit is a single point of failure. I mean, you're asking a lot of uh, you're asking a lot of the customer to just take something offline, put some new software in, and then validate on a live system. Uh -huh. I mean, that's that's sure. a huge barrier for a lot of customers. Absolutely, and you know, even and the companies that do have fully redundant systems are so terrified about losing half their system. 
I mean, the, the aluminum company in, is a case in point. I mean, they were just very reluctant to do anything that would jeopardize even 50% because of the, the cost. So, you, but you brought up another really good point, backing out. <laughs> You know, most of the times on an embedded system, if you go one way, you're go I mean, if you load, you are not unloading. You are not taking that, that back to the old version. And, you know, because that costs money, it's more effort, people are in a rush to get a patch out, um, but uh, um, reversing a patch is something that's pretty uh, rare. And, and yet, I think that would improve the acceptance if people thought they could get out. Okay, one last question. Uh, so, do you do like any third-party pen tests on your products? Like, uh, do other people test our product? Yeah. Yes. Like f formally. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. We both we both uh, fuzz test our product. We do um, threat models against our product. We fuzz test our product, and we've given our product to other people to beat up. Absolutely. And it's always a learning experience every time. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eric. Excellent Thanks. job. Okay, so that's it for